Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Cecilia Rouse. I'm the president here at the Brookings Institution. And it is my honor to welcome you all to today's event, hosted by the Global Economy and Development Program, to launch the third annual report of the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, the USMCA. Today's conversation focuses on the importance of the USMCA for the United States and the region's prosperity and economic security. This is clearly a pivotal time for the U.S. and the world when it comes to international trade. The current system for world trade based on the World Trade Organization is being challenged and countries around the world are assessing their stance on their engagement on their international stage. And yet, USMCA passed U.S. Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support. It provides the opportunity for three countries to enter a conversation about what they can achieve together for the prosperity of their populations. For our part, Brookings established the Brookings USMCA initiative shortly after the passage of the agreement. Our goal is to build an evidence base to understand the impact of the USMCA on trade, investments, and jobs. The initiative is also tracking how the USMCA affects labor and environmental standards, as well as employment and production in manufacturing and agriculture. Okay, but on to today's program. First, I want to welcome all of our, and thank all of our panelists. Some are in person and some are virtual, many of whom also contributed to the report. In our first panel today, Joshua Meltzer will hold a fireside chat with U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai. Josh is a senior fellow in our Global Economy and Development Program and the lead scholar on the USMCA initiative. He is a trade expert on the economic and trade implications of digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, where he co-leads the Brookings Forum on Cooperation in AI. Josh has testified before the U.S. Congress and the European Parliament and recently concluded a stint on the National Institute of Standards Technology, otherwise known as NIST, Advisory Committee on International Standards. He is also a member of Australia's National Data Advisory Council and a regular contributor to media outlets including the New York Times, CNN, and Bloomberg. But before I turn the podium over to Josh, I want to say we are honored to have Ambassador Tai with us today. I had the pleasure of working with her during my time as chair of the White House at the Council of Economic Advisors, and I deeply respect her uh, subject matter expertise, savvy, and as well as her friendship. Ambassador Tai, thank you for your public service, and Brookings is grateful for your collaboration and the, with your office and you for your contribution on the USMCA annual report that we are launching today. And so with that, I once again say welcome, and I invite Josh to the podium. Uh, thanks, um, Celia, for those uh, welcoming remarks. And I also want to welcome everyone here today in person and online and also want to extend my uh, thanks to Ambassador Tai for being here today for the fireside chat. I'll introduce you and call you up onto the stage shortly. And I want to also thank uh, panellists who are here in person and online and also for their contributions to the report as well. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to have a discussion about USMCA, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, and its importance for North American economic relations. Uh, we're launching our report, USMCA Forward, uh, gearing up for a successful USMCA review in 2026. Uh, as all big projects are, it's a team effort, so I really want to give a call out to uh, Mata Carmen, Diego, Esther, Janine, Izzy, the whole tech team, and the leadership of Vice President Brahima Kulabali as well. Uh, this is the third such report uh, that we've launched as part of the USMCA initiative. And um, as outlined by uh, the Brookings president just now, this initiative was set up shortly after USMCA came into effect uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to really reset the conversation and develop a vision for what we can achieve together here in North America. And to that end, we provide a lot of data and evidence to inform the conversation and identify how we can build a more competitive inclusive and sustainable North American economic relationships. And to that end, some of the key products of our initiative are a USMCA tracker. Uh, if you haven't visited, it's online at the Brookings uh, Institute website. We provide the most up-to-date data on goods and services flows at the national and state and provincial levels as well. 
We provide the data on services and investment flow, and importantly, the jobs that are supported by exports within North America. And according to our data, that is around 17 million jobs across the three economies. We also track all meetings and disputes, and we've developed a USMCA scorecard which assesses compliance by all three governments with their USMCA commitments. And we have a newsletter and we do convenings and um, analysis and various reports as well. I'd like to start with the, some of the data from our USMCA tracker just to level set the importance of the trade relationship in North America. It is, the USMCA is clearly the most important trade agreement for each country. Around 78% of Canadian exports go to the US and Mexico. Around 85% of Mexican exports go to the US and Canada. Around 30% of US exports go to Canada and Mexico, which is about four times US exports to China. And a lot of this is in intermediate products which cross borders multiple times to make complex goods like vehicles, IT equipment and medical supplies. In 2023, trade in North America was about $1.85 trillion, about $3 million per minute. This is a 47% increase since 2020 when USMCA came into effect. And since 2020, approximately 4 million new jobs has been created as a result of trade in North America. Cecilia, in her introductory remarks, also made the observation about how this is a pivotal time in world trade, and there are significant implications of this for North America. On the one hand, over the last few years, we have seen some of the risks, but also resiliency from supply chains. COVID showed us some of the risks of relying on China for supplies of medical products, but it also showed the strong performance of North American supply chains when it came to delivering, delivering medical equipment and more. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated the global trade implications of even localised conflicts, and trade relations are being fundamentally rethought in light of geopolitical competition with China. Now, this competition with China has at its core different systems of government, different values and visions for the international order, and is also in many ways a product of China's economic model that provides enormous subsidies to manufacturing which leads to an oversupply of products, increasingly in high technology products like electric vehicles, and with low levels of domestic demand results in increasing reliance by China on exports to the US and Europe in particular to absorb this excess production. And China has also demonstrated that where countries rely on it as a key source of supply or as a market for its exports, China will use its leverage to coerce cooperation to achieve other political objectives. So what does this mean for North America? Well, the fact is China will remain a manufacturing and trade powerhouse. My late colleague David Dollar, in an earlier contribution to one of our USMCA forward reports, um, found that China's manufacturing output is about 20 times larger than Mexico. So there is no way that Mexico is going to replace China as a source of manufacturing, and that should not be the goal. But de-risking trade with China requires creating alternative sources of supply, particularly in products that are critical for economic and national security. And 2D risk requires even closer North American cooperation, more trade and investment, and a bigger vision for what we can achieve together on climate, digital, labour, worker training, and more. And this is where USMCA is so important, both economically but also as a geostrategic opportunity. The agreement's zero tariffs and binding legal commitments reduce the cost and risks of cross-border trade. Indeed, the US International Trade Commission, in its assessment of the economic benefits of USMCA, highlighted the importance of policy certainty. And reducing risk is particularly important when it comes to making large and long-term investments in areas such as semiconductors, clean energy or electric vehicles. And the ability to develop this new manufacturing capacity using supply chains across our three countries make it, makes our manufacturing more efficient and more competitive globally. And the agreement's rules on environment, digital, SMEs, IP, services and more is also key for enabling trade and investment. The USMCA is arguably also an important response to what we've seen as a political backlash against trade in the US. It had large bipartisan support in Congress, support from key unions, and is a potential new model for trade agreements moving forward. Why? Because we have strong labour and environmental commitments, tighter rules of origin, which makes sure that you have to invest in North America to take advantage of the agreement's preferences, reform dispute settlement, particularly when it comes to invested state dispute settlement, and we'll talk about a lot more about this this afternoon. Let me now turn briefly to the USMCA report we're launching today. 
uh, as I said, titled towards a successful review in 2030, 2026. So we're now about halfway between USMCA coming into effect and this joint review which the agreement mandates in 2026, which essentially requires all the parties to agree in 2026 to renew the agreement for another 16 years. Failure to do that means that there's essentially joint reviews for another 10 years, and if we fail to agree to renew the agreement during that 10-year period, USMCA expires in 2036. So with this in mind, the report asks the questions of how is USMCA going, what, why does it matter, and what more can we do with an eye towards successful review in 2026? Like previous reports, we have chapters authored by leading experts from academia and think tanks and shorter policy-focused what we call viewpoints by leaders from government, business and civil society. And these viewpoints provide crucial political and policy context to the issues and ideas that are raised in the report. And here, in terms of the viewpoints, I want to just give a call out to the contributors. Again, thank you, Ambassador Tai, also Canadian Energy and National Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, Governor of Chihuahua Maria Eugenia Galvan, Roberto Alvarez, Head of North America in the Mexican Foreign Ministry, AFL-CIO President Liz Shula, business leaders including President of the American Chamber of Commerce Susan Clark, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada Goldie Hyder, OTA CEO and Business Roundtable Chair Judy Marks, CEO of SoftBank Blanca Trevino, Jose Zazaya and OTA CEO Becerra. And I want to sh shout out especially to Pat Otensmeyer, former CEO of Kansas City Southern, Pablo Gonzalez, CEO of Kimberly Clark, Mexico, and Paul Demaray Jr., Chairman of Power Corporation of Canada, for their co-authored forward to the report. In terms of the chapters in the report and what comes out of it, there are a couple of key issues I want to highlight. One is the chapter by Luz Maria de la Mora, Mexico's former Vice Minister for Foreign Trade, who looks at the state of North American economic relations and the contribution of USMCA in that space. We have two chapters on the importance of the labour provisions in USMCA because of its obvious importance there. One chapter is by Kathleen Clauston from Georgetown, who looks at the operation of the rapid response mechanism, what we have learned from it so far, and proposes some practical reforms to make it work more effectively. We have another chapter by Alfredo Dominguez, Mexico's General Director of the Federal Centre for Conciliation and Labour Registration, who looks at Mexico's labour reforms and progress and how the USMCA Labour Chapter has contributed to these efforts. The USMCA as a source of stability in the region is also an important focus for the report. We have an analysis of the institutional underpinnings to the North American economic relations, co-authored by three former ambassadors from the US, Mexico and Canada, ambassadors Anthony Wayne, Jeronimo Guterres and Louise Blaise, respectively, who looked at the range of USMCA meetings and other trilateral and bilateral government and business meetings which underpin the relationship, and we look at it and ask what more can be done there. We have a chapter by Professor of International Law Rob House from NYU who looks at the transformation to dispute settlement mechanisms under USMCA and how they have been working in their contribution to stability and certainty in the region as well. The report also gets into the topics of energy and digital trade and where more progress can be made. We have a chapter on energy by Oscar Ocampo who outlines the opportunity of a more integrated North American digital market to achieve um, energy independence and support the transition to cleaner energy. And we have a chapter on building a more digitally integrated North American market by Alejandra Palacios, the former chair of Mexico's antitrust agency, and Christian Norton, who identify areas such as artificial intelligence and more cooperation of cybersecurity, amongst others. In a final chapter I co-author with Steve Ahur, we look at how the USMCA joint review um, can be used to keep USMCA updated while also renewing USMCA to avoid the uncertainty and cost to trade and investment that failure to renew the agreement would create. Uh, we have a one-pager that's been distributed with a QR code and so you can get access to the report easily. Um, Ambassador Ty, I'd like to call you up uh, to the stage. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to introduce you shortly. You need no introduction. Um, <laughs> uh, but you are, you know, you were appointed in March 2021 um, with unanimous Senate confirmation to serve as the uh, 19th USTR. 
key member of the President's Cabinet in this role. You're the Principal Trade Advisor, Negotiator and Spokesman for US Trade Policy. Uh, you were previously Chief Trade Counsel and Trade Subcommittee Staff Director for the House Ways and Means Committee, where you have played a pivotal role in shaping US trade law um, in bilateral and multilateral agreements. A pleasure to have you with us here today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and this is one of my favourite topics. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Same. Good. Um, so, it's been almost four years since USMCA came into effect. And I want to kick off, I think, with asking you about the state of trade relations in North America. The Biden administration has passed very significant legislation that seems to create real opportunities to expand opportunities in North America. And here I'm thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Sciences Act. Um, how does trade and investment with our North American partners contribute to the administration's goals? You've outlined a number of times of resiliency in supply chains, addressing climate change, uh, building semiconductor capacity and so forth. Um, and you've just, the President's just released his 2024 trade policy and how does that kind of add to the picture? Yes. Um, well, thank you. I feel so seen here in your introduction talking about USMCA and um, your introduction of me and the trade policy agenda. Um, so. Uh, this is a this is a real real delight. Uh, this is the um, uh, you know uh, the trade community uh, and um, the uh, influencers and thinkers in uh, our particular policy world. Um, so the question that you ask is a, a really really wonderful one because um, when we talk about the USMCA, uh, we have to recognize that the USMCA is a reborn version of the trade agreement that had been um, uh, the glue between the North American, U.S., Mexico, and uh, Canada countries. Um, and um, uh, I think I'll begin with this. Uh, let's give this agreement, where we are right now, a little bit of historical context, and we'll just layer on uh, to your very insightful remarks before. Um, the, um, the NAFTA uh, was really powerful in integrating supply chains, before we talked about supply chains as such, across North America. And a couple areas, and uh, you know, if you go back and further into my background, uh, you'll know that I was a trade litigator um, for many years at USTR before I went over to the Hill. Um, <clears throat> it became very clear to me through that role as a trade litigator, uh, the areas where NAFTA had been uh, powerfully successful in integrating uh, industries in the supply chains across uh, these three uh, economies. Uh, one is in agriculture, in particular in um, uh, the production of uh, meat uh, and protein. Um, uh, one uh, is in uh, uh, industry with respect to steel. And then the third is um, the auto supply chain. Um, you have to understand when you're looking at uh, the industry here in the United States that um, this industry uh, is uh, connected across these three countries in particular. And all of that came about as a result of uh, the power of this trade agreement. Um, so um, let's come to today. You see from uh, President Biden in his accomplishments economically uh, these um, investments that, frankly, we've known we have had to make in ourselves for a long time that uh, President Biden has managed to accomplish. Um, to people's surprise, although not to our surprise. First is the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I'm going to tap down on the infrastructure law piece as well because a part of the, the trade conversation for a long time has been uh, as we pursue these very comprehensive, aggressively liberalizing trade agreements, um, we have not kept up with uh, updating and upgrading our own infrastructure. Um, how does that make sense as you try to tap, you know, one theory of um, economic growth and activity through liberalization while your infrastructure is aging every year that goes by. So that's one element I want to call to mind, which is along with the renewal of this trade agreement, what you have are finally investments in American infrastructure, American workers, American industry that have to come along with a modern view to uh, what economic development looks like, um, uh, how you stay in the game of industrialization, and then to a point that you made that was so profound in your introduction, uh, how you can succeed and coexist and compete in a global economy, 
here as a North American um, um, coalition, if you will, uh, in an economy that is so dominated by the Chinese economic footprint and the Chinese economic machine. So, um, you know, in terms of what you see in the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, it is actually an expression of a, um, a unique, modern, American industrial policy. And I think it is really important to understand that um, this kind of focus on supply chains and industrial policy has been happening since as long as we have had NAFTA, that the NAFTA itself had an impact on uh, our industrial development um, through the lens of liberalization, right? Uh, so what's really important, I think, in looking at the investments that we are making right now is that they um, have to be able to work with our role as a trading nation in the world and in North America. Um, let me just take the autos piece as a really salient example. In the Inflation Reduction Act, one of the provisions that has um, uh, caused um, us to be on the receiving end of a lot of attention from our closest trading partners uh, goes to the um, incentives and the preferences that attach to um, uh, EV assembly and then also the components that go into the EV batteries. So what I want to reflect to all of you is this is an expression of modern American industrial policy around uh, um, uh, clean uh, cars um, that takes into account that our supply chain is one that runs across North America because there is a benefit that attaches to North American assembly. And then there's another benefit with respect to the components that go into EV batteries that attaches to free trade agreement partners, right? So that is a recognition within this um, a very powerful um, revitalization piece for the American economy of the principles of nearshoring through this North American assembly piece and friendshoring through this idea that FTA partners um, also are read into uh, the benefits of what we're putting together. Is the Inflation Reduction Act a perfect piece of legislation or a perfect expression of a new type of American industrial policy? No, but I think that is something that we're going to have to continue to work on. Next point I wanted to make, just again using autos as a really important example. Um, we have actually been doing industrial policy on automobiles for um, a long time. Uh, probably we can reach back even further into memory, but I'm just going to start with uh, 2009 and the uh, enormous intervention uh, made by the U.S. government to uh, um, uh, shore up uh, our domestic auto manufacturers, right? That is an expression of industrial policy. We came face to face with the possibility that we might lose these industries, and we collectively said, no, that is not that is not an acceptable outcome for us, for our country, for our security, for our economic security, for indus our industrial footprint. Uh, second point, in the USMCA, you talked about the rules of origin and the tightening of the rules of origin. I will tell you that uh, over the course of the 20-plus years of the NAFTA, um, uh, those tariffs had been eliminated for most of those 20 years. Uh, the only place where we really tightened up the rules of origins was with respect to the auto supply chain. And so what you saw in the renegotiation of the NAFTA and the rebirth into the USMCA is actually the Trump administration's imprint on uh, an industrial policy for America in the context of North American for the auto supply chain. And then you come to where we are right now with the Inflation Reduction Act. You see another iteration of uh, an industrial policy with the clean technology transition, the green and just transition uh, superimposed. And I think that um, to your point about uh, our concern around um, EV overcapacity and overproduction happening in China, the economic dynamics there, and what we know is coming for North America, that is going to require us, again, to come through and to think through how we, as a North American supply chain, are going to confront that um, existential challenge uh, to this industry. So I think that you know the USMCA is really, really cutting edge in a number of ways beyond what people appreciate. And um, it is part of the reason why it receives rightly so much attention. But I, I also want to really touch on the point that the USMCA uh, isn't a final destination, but it is the best example we have of the United States leading 
uh, with two of our uh, closest trading partners and our two contiguous neighbors in um, navigating innovation and trade policy to keep up with the times and the challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing up the infrastructure uh, bill. There's been so much going on with this administration, um, and that happened earlier on that it's easy to overlook, but obviously a very significant contribution to the ability of America to compete. Um, absolutely. Um, I'd like to change, uh, like pick up on this theme of, you know, some of the key changes in USMCA and just have a get into labour a little bit. I mean, you've been a, um, you know, a strong advocate for a labour-centred trade policy, and I'm not telling anything you don't know, or probably most of the people in this room don't know about, you know, how the Labor chapter and the rapid response mechanism has really been, you know, one of the big innovations in this trade agreement. Um, and, and for those who are not following this as closely um, as, as we are, you know, this chapter essentially includes binding commitments um, to labour rights, um, including, you know, freedom of association, eliminate, eliminating all forms of forced labour with a rapid response mechanism which allows for sort of facility-specific targeted um, work against facilities that are not honouring or respecting these labour rights with the opportunities to raise tariffs and working with the Mexican government to ex ex essentially exact changes. I'm sure you might be able to explain that in a more eloquent way. But what I wanted to kind of segue into was um, how you see this going so far. We've had um, we've had three or four years now with the rapid response mechanism. Um, the US government has been using this mechanism a lot um, with a lot of success, I think. Um, what have we learned so far in terms of how it's working and the results that we're seeing in terms of labour outcomes in Mexico? So, truly, this is one of my favourite topics within one of my favourite topics, right? So, um, uh, this labour mechanism, the um, uh, upgrading of the rules uh, and um, the high standards, the enforceability and the commitments across the three economies, uh, and also this facility-specific uh, labor uh, mechanism that we call the rapid response mechanism. It's able to pierce the, just the state-to-state -state interaction to go into the facilities and to essentially hold the facilities responsible for whether or not they are complying with Mexican law and the uh, commitments that are required under this uh, international agreement. Um, it is going really well. Uh, but I also want to reinforce something that's in my written piece, which is uh, this set of uh, improvements to the NAFTA that you see in the USMCA were really fundamental to our being able to um, extend to um, our uh, stakeholders, um, our political supporters, um, our businesses, the credibility that the USMCA did something to improve on the NAFTA. And that requires you to know the history of the NAFTA, the controversy around its birth in 1993, its negotiation in the years before then, its entry into force in 1994, and the um, extreme amounts of anxiety and concern that by bringing Mexico so um, uh, closely into the US and the Canadian uh, economies, that you would see what we have called the race to the bottom, uh, that without more and better assurances, that you would see the erosion of rights and standards and protections for labor and workers and for the environment over time. And that is something that actually we did see. It is something that you need to go to our industrial Midwest to fully understand the impacts um, uh, on communities, uh, on industries, and I'm not saying that the NAFTA was the only contributor to what we saw with respect to a significant deindustrialization within the United States. There were other factors as well, certainly, um, you know, the entry of China into the WTO, uh, the advancement of technology, but uh, this trade agreement's contributions and the concerns that were there at its birth absolutely a part of the equation. So in terms of the renegotiation of the NAFTA, what you saw was a coalescence around the exercise, whether it was from people who felt comfortable with the NAFTA, who felt like, well, it's been almost 25 years, we should modernize it, to the people who felt like uh, the NAFTA had left behind uh, scar tissue um, uh, and injury, 
um, to entire communities and to industries. And the, this mechanism, along with a number of the other uh, core innovative components of the USMCA, uh, was our expression collectively on a bipartisan basis and a very unusual bipartisan um, renegotiation of the USMCA, where it was the Trump administration and congressional Democrats. A huge amount of the focus was on um, how do we take a trade program that had been working very well in some regards and working very poorly in other regards, and how could you improve it? And I think that the creation of this mechanism allowed for us to be credible in selling a promise that this would be better. And then our Biden administration leaning in to implementing and using this mechanism with the partnership of the Mexican government, Economia and STPS, the, the Labor Secretariat, uh, to making this work um, is an enormous realization of uh, the hope that we have held out. Um, is this the solution to all of the challenges that we face in this North American uh, arrangement and more broadly? No. Is it a part of the solution? Yes. And does it give us a really important element to work with in articulating what is a way that we can trade with each other and build our middle classes together? This is our most concrete example of what we're doing. So what's happening? We have brought uh, 19 cases uh, uh, as the United States. 16 of them have been resolved. In the 16 that have been resolved, we have positively impacted 27,000 workers in Mexico. And that means that as a result of these petitions that have been filed and the work that we have done on a cooperative basis between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, we have allowed for real people, real workers on the factory floor to um, receive back pay in the millions of dollars, to receive uh, improved wages, to uh, have uh, redos on uh, union elections where they have been allowed to and have successfully elected independent unions to represent them, to then represent them in accomplishing uh, and concluding collective bargaining agreements that actually reflect those workers' interests. Um, and uh, the uh, achievement of um, improved benefits for those workers. We're tremendously proud of our ability to prove this concept. And I want to just take a step back and say for everyone who was dialed into uh, the conversation and the, um, the legacy of the negative impacts of NAFTA on working people and their leverage and their uh, livelihoods here in the United States, consider this that for the first time in our history, we are offering to workers a mechanism for advocating for themselves, to empowering themselves uniquely through a trade agreement, that the trade agreement has become a part of the solution. And by Mexican workers becoming empowered to advocate for themselves and improve their working conditions, we are improving the working conditions and the negotiating leverage of American workers who have been pitted against their Mexican brethren for a very long time. right? And so I think that when we come into this um, rethink across the board in terms of how we do trade, we often find ourselves pointing to our experience in the USMCA to say there is, in fact, another way to do this. And I think that is a really powerful point that uh, we need to get across to more people because it is going to allow us to reframe trade as not something that takes away from working people uh, and um, uh, basically sacrifices their interests to greater efficiencies and GDP growth, um, but is a way of making them a centerpiece for uh, economic growth and development. And I think, you know, in your uh, rundown, in your introduction of the importance of this um, uh, economic relationship between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, uh, you ran through some really important statistics. Um, I feel like what we need to do going forward, recognizing the pieces of the USMCA is including in those statistics um, a tracking and metrics in terms of um, 
uh, any changes in the productivity of our workers and also changes in wage growth and changes in uh, unionization rates because I think that part of what we are seeing, and it's not just about the USMCA, but the USMCA is a, a not insignificant factor in this, uh, the growth in um, uh, the union and labor movement across the borders in the United States and Mexico and also in Canada as well. Great, thank you. Um, and that's um, a to-do list for us for the USMCA tracker, um, so we'll get on to that. Uh, I would like to uh, turn now, keeping up with this theme of sort of the developments that have been new and important in USMCA, to move on to dispute settlement. Um, there, was, there was no state-to-state -state dispute settlement um, that worked under NAFTA uh, for various reasons. That was reformed, and so we now have seen, um, I think, about eight state-to-state -state dispute settlements. Each government has taken advantage of it. Uh, as I said before, we, ha we track, we have a scorecard which assesses compliance. It's a mixed scorecard for, for everyone. Um, the US has brought um, a case recently against Mexico and biotech corn, cases against Canada on dairy. Uh, the US lost the case on auto rules of origin um, and, and has yet to comply with that. Um, what I'd like to do is um, you know, ask you a question about how you see dispute settlement at the state-to-state -state level um, working at the moment. Um, anything you might want to say about any of the specific disputes as well? Sure. So um, I, I want to really reinforce something for folks in terms of understanding the trade agreement. An, an enforcement mechanism is important, just as in any contract, just as in the laws, for making real the commitments and the obligations and responsibilities. Right? But you have to understand that in a trade agreement, it is, a, it is essentially a contract between sovereigns. And so a dispute settlement system within a trade agreement has to balance uh, the rendering of a, uh, a decision uh, and conclusions from a, a, a legal process uh, with the fact of um, uh, the sovereignty that's retained by the parties to the agreement. And so whether it's in the USMCA, any of our other trade agreements, or at the WTO, the dispute settlement process is something that gives you a right at the end to take away something from your trading partner. It's not supposed to be a punishment, although you can see it as a punishment, but the theory behind the way we do dispute settlement in trade agreements between sovereigns is your right to suspend a concession, to take back something that you had promised under the trade agreement, is intended to be an inducement to finding a solution compliance or an accommodation, whatever is going to work at the political level between the sovereigns, right? So is never meant to be something that you can shove down the throat of the other side because that is, that's just not the way that international agreements between sovereign countries work. Um, so under the NAFTA, I think that uh, there were four cases that were brought until um, we collectively kind of broke the system. So it was important in the USMCA to uh, revive a functioning dispute settlement system. But when you get to the end of the system, and um, uh, we see this in uh, the examples that you've given, at the end, the question is always going to be, <clears throat> do you have enough, have you changed the leverage composition to get to the political solution that you need? And in the case of dairy, the answer is no. That despite two cases that we have brought, and the expectation under the agreement that um, American dairy farmers and producers would have more access to the Canadian market, uh, we still do not have that access. And frankly, we're not the only ones. Uh, it turns out that uh, Canada has been sued under the CPTPP by New Zealand uh, around the same set of uh, policies with the same result. So there what I would say is we have a political conundrum uh, despite the best efforts of our dispute settlement system, we've still not been able to crack the political nut there. That is something for us to continue to work on and think through. How do we address that concern that we have with Canada? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to put the dispute settlement system into that, um, that context. It is really important to have those systems be able to work, but we also have to understand what, the, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, in the auto rules context... Um, I want to pick up a couple additional historical contextual data points. Um, recall that the USMCA, the NAFTA was renegotiated into the USMCA, and I think that the three parties concluded um, the first iteration of USMCA at the end of 2018. 
Um, then came the second renegotiation of the USMC that was driven by um, the uh, uh, Trump administration uh, needing to get it through the Congress, and that um, you know Trump administration uh, congressional Democrat renegotiation of the USMCA. That happened over the course of 2019. The House vote, um, broad bipartisan basis, um, 385 members voting for it, uh, happened on, uh, I believe it's December 19th of 2019. It passed through the Senate at the end of January in 2020. I give you these dates because what I want to emphasize is by the time the USMCA enters into force, it is July 1st of 2020, and the pandemic has happened. And that was the first indication we had that the world that we had renegotiated the USMCA for was in the process of fundamentally changing again. In the meantime, since Jan July 1st of 2020 to today, uh, March of 2024, the other aspect of what we've seen is an acceleration in countries, including U.S., Canada, and Mexico, motivation to act on the climate crisis and the urgency around um, uh, uh, counterbalancing the market's failure to activate the kinds of clean energy technology boost that we're going to need to respond to the climate crisis. That also, these, the pandemic, and I would say the clean energy transition necessities have fundamentally changed the equation around multiple aspects of uh, this trade relationship, but with a special focus on autos. So I think that the conversation within the USMCA on autos has to be something larger than what has happened in this dispute. This dispute is important. Those rules of origin and our lack of uh, agreement on what those rules of origin mean is an important component. But with an eye towards 2026, the more important question, in addition to, sorry, the third challenge is uh, the Chinese overcapacity challenge on EVs. How are we as these three countries going to reassert our interest in each other's success, reassert our stakes in this supply chain to, um, uh, to keep pace with the changes and the pressures that are affecting all three of us at the same time. So the dispute settlement system, an imp incredibly important component, but I want to put it in the context of um, leading us to a political solution and then that political solution needing to address the changes that are happening even uh, to, as we speak to our most modernized and most updated trade arrangement. Great. Um, I'm just going to ask you one final question. I want to pick up, you mentioned the review in 2026. Obviously, we framed the report thinking about the review in 2026. There's going to be elections here in Canada, most likely, and certainly in Mexico as well between now and then. Yes. Um, but to the extent that you've given this thought, um, how do you see the joint review mechanism? What would you think it should be trying to accomplish how do you think about the importance of renewing USMTO? So this review mechanism, when it was at first proposed, uh, was tremendously controversial. So uh, the amount of time it took for you to explain how the mechanism works is a reflection of the compromise that had to be reached in order to land a review mechanism at all. Uh, I think that the first iteration of uh, this proposal was at the five-year mark. You come together, you either pledge this is working, we're going to continue, or the agreement stops. Uh, and so this very complex, it happens at the six-year mark. If you don't have agreement, you have 10 years for it to peter out. If it renews, it's another you know, X number of years. Uh, it's a negotiated outcome. But I think the most important piece is, as you rightly have focused on, um, it is a point, it is an inflection point for um, essentially a reevaluation of how the agreement is working. I think that the disputes... Uh, and the disputes outcomes uh, need to be a part of this to the extent that we're not able to resolve the disputes using the dispute settlement system itself only. Uh, the other piece of it is going to have to be, how has the world changed since the pandemic? Um, uh, what is the, uh, the clean tech revolution and the climate crisis um, uh, affecting this arrangement between the three countries? And then also, the, the China piece cannot be... Uh, 
understated or overstated, sorry. Uh, it is going to be, and it already is, a really important element of uh, tension and concern that is coming up in uh, this uh, very intimate trade relationship that we have between three countries. We are now contending with the fact that uh, there are other players that are every day impacting how we relate to each other and how we compete globally. Uh, so um, there is a lot for us to work on working towards 2026. And it's the type of thing where we can't just wake up on January 1, 2026 and say, well, now what are we doing? Which is why I think that this series of reports that you're putting out, this conversation that I'm participating in, that you're hosting, is so incredibly important. We have to be tracking everything along the way so that we're prepared for that moment. One question that you posed, which was, how do we take up this review in 2026 without fundamentally destabilizing the relationship? I think that that's a absolutely valid and important. But I do also want to caution, you do not want that review to happen in a way that all three parties come to the conversation too comfortable. The whole point is to maintain a certain level of discomfort, which may involve a certain level of uncertainty, to keep the parties motivated to do the really hard thing, which is to continue to reevaluate our trade policies and our trade programs to ensure that they're really responding to the changes that are happening around us. These changes, they are um, on multiple levels. They're happening really, really fast. And if we don't stay motivated to respond, then we are going to lose. And so uh, that review mechanism is important. It is important for us to come to that conversation responsibly, but we also have to be honest, and we also have to understand that that discomfort is actually a feature, not a bug. Great. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So, Ambassador Tai, I want to say thank you so very much for your time and your very fulsome and thoughtful responses. Thank you very much, thank Josh. You. It's been a pleasure to be with all of you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you so much. I'm going to. Uh, um, you? I don't think we're on. No, babe. Okay. Do you want this water clean? Like, yeah, I just poured it. Okay, yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> I think she already took my speech. <laughs> We could all be seated, please. We're going to start the, the next panel. Okay, it's my, uh, it's my pleasure to start the next uh, panel. Uh, let me, I'm just going to shortly introduce our two panellists. Um, online, virtually, uh, it's, it's my pleasure.
pleasure to um, introduce Juan Gallardo, um, who is president of the board of directors of Cultiva Organization, one of Mexico's leading sugar producers and bottling group, GEJEP, which is the only Pepsi Cola bottling company in Mexico. Um, Juan's a member of the International Advisory Board of Banco Santander and Rabobank, and he's a board member of various other companies. He's very extensive background when it comes to North American trade. He played a key role um, representing the Mexican private sector during the negotiation of a number of Mexico's international trade treaties and certainly also for NAFTA. So, Juan, very uh, big pleasure to have you dialing in virtually from Mexico. And um, here in person is Kathy Feingold, who's the director of the AFL-CIO's international department. Uh, Kathy is well known to um, many people as a passionate advocate for labour rights. She, in 2018, she was also elected deputy president of the International Trade Union Confederation, uh, which represents about 200 million unionised workers worldwide. Uh, Kathy is also a member of Secretary Blinken's Foreign Affairs Policy Board, where she provides input on a worker-centred foreign policy agenda. Um, as well as um, a member of the Independent Mexico Labor Board, um, export, Expert Board, uh, created under USMCA to monitor and evaluate labor reforms and worker rights compliance in Mexico. So welcome, welcome, Kathy. Um, I want to keep... I'm going to ask the panellists individual questions, but please sort of feel free to both of you come in on, on any of these questions. And, Juan, I'm going to um, start with you and pick up on um, some of the... Um, conversation we just had with Ambassador Tai about the opportunities um, of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Sciences Act for Mexico and the role of USMCA in enabling that opportunity in building out sort of new manufacturing supply chains, whether it's in semiconductors or EV in batteries. How, how does that look from where you sit? How well is Mexico positioned at the moment to take advantage of these opportunities? Uh, thank you. Just first of all, let me just say uh, on a personal note, thank you very much for including me in this in this panel. I'm delighted to share it with Catherine. I also feel that the timing is couldn't be better. And the fact that we are, as you well know, uh, pr uh, preparing ourselves each for the review process that will occur in, in at the end of 2026, uh, sharing how we are progressing and what is our concerns, I think is of enormous importance. So thank you, thank Brookings, and I think it's most timely. Also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Thai because I was very pleased to see her evaluation, especially of the labor side. I think all, both sides have made an enormous effort to progress in that sense. And there's, there's a very, very clear indications that it is complying with what it wanted to, to get done. And probably to answer your question directly, the most important thing that we needed to get across is this question of preparation and transition. And people talk of the nearshoring as if it were occurring yesterday. The fact is, it started occurring with NAFTA 30 years ago, and uh, what is occurring today is simply a consolidation of that process due to the many, many transformations that have occurred during the NAFTA process, as Ambassador Tai recognized also. Uh, of, her co of those comments, the most important for me is the part of the people transformation. And that people transformation has to do with the dispute settlement systems and the fact that enormous transformation has occurred in our country uh, in terms of new, new leaderships. And uh, in, uh, I won't uh, repeat the numbers that were already mentioned, the amount of, of uh, uh, contracts registered now with a new voting system, the amount of uh, uh, supervision that the fast, rapid mechanism has offered and worked. It's, it's really amazing how well both governments have been able to uh, get this thing under, in a way that creates a mood, Josh, and that is so important, of a joint solution, of finding solutions to each one of these different conflicts in a constructive and friendly and uh, innovative way. And so. Uh, there's one piece of information that I think is incredibly important. Uh, Mexico uh, authorities recognize different uh, leadership groups 
in terms of labor. And up until the time that this had what got, went into effect, we had something like 690 leadership groups. And the last number that was given by the authorities, and I want to make sure I quote this properly, is 7,535. What that means is that born through this process have occurred a number of new leaders who are bringing uh, uh, very many innovative ways to the whole question of labor relations. And I think that that in itself is extremely important. So in our preparation, as uh, uh, coming back, the uh, first element is this question of people. The second is the enormous work that has occurred in the supply chains. And uh, yes, a lot of it driven, in fact, by COVID at one point because of the crisis itself. But the whole supply chain momentum has uh, maintained itself and increased very significantly. And I think that one of the elements that is missing still and that we're very conscious of is the whole question of infrastructure. There's more infrastructure to be built. We need to make sure that we're the competitive partner and the useful uh, uh, in every sense. And I think that the new programs that will be occurring within the change of governments and so on will certainly allow that to happen. The appetite is there, the resources are there, the needs are there, and even the broadening of the, of the uh, geographical areas. As you know, Mexico is making a big effort to bring the southern part of Mexico into the, into the fold. And that in itself is a marvelous, fantastic challenge that will take generations. So I would say that in our preparation, the next thing that has been very important is the concept of rule of law and, uh, in, and, uh, and full compliance. And as we come to the point of the review in 2026, I think it's going to be enormously important that all three partners have complied fully with what they said they were going to do. And that applies, obviously, to Mexico. And in the case of Mexico, and I'll speak it out clearly, we have had several panels they were working. The agricultural one is working. So as, uh, as mentioned, it is a mechanism that has its, uh, its timings and its checks and balances, but it's operating. The, uh, the whole uh, question of labor, as we already said, has undergone a litmus test of this, these last two or four years, which makes us feel that we will be able to continue with the compliance. Because the fact, Josh, that things are still missing is not surprising. We're always going to have something else that needs to be done. But the fact that the teams are working as teams and that there's built a confidence and a relationship and a trust, I think, is enormously important. And finally, last but not least, the biggest element of, in the compliance was the whole energy side in, for Mexico. And as I'm sure you know, Mexico, the Supreme Court turned down the, 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 the initiative, the energy initiative that had been put forth by this government, uh, the uh, present government, and so there is no longer a reason for a differential in the energy side. It's going to be very important to have the kind of low-cost energy, both clean and uh, everything else, and I think that that door has now been opened. And so this is just three examples of how we're moving towards a review where we feel very strongly that the review should be precisely that, a review. Not, and it's not the opportunity for everybody to come in with new suggestions of what they would like to see in the trade agreement, because I think that would block the road to what we just mentioned. And I think that the words of, uh, of Ambassador Tai couldn't be more appropriate you know, seeking to reassert our interest and joint interest in the investment of the trade of innovation and with a number of things. And that's where your role is going to be very important as we bring together all these different elements. But I think that we're all moving in the right direction. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm delighted to be able to share this opportunity with three very good friends. Alejandra, Luz Maria, and Geronio uh, all have done a, a magnificent contributions during these years to the Mexican side of things. And um, uh, I think that uh, we will be prepared. We are getting prepared, and we will be successful in bridging these different challenges that are set there right now. 
Right, well, thank you. That's uh, comprehensive and opens a lot of doors, I think, for conversation. Um, Cathy, let me turn to you. I'm going to ask you uh, pretty much the same question I asked and Bess at a tie, which is, you know, we're three or four years into USMCA. How is the Labor chapter, the rapid response mechanism going from your perspective? Well, thank you so much, and thanks for having me back here. And as I was sitting down there, I was like, wait a second, she's outlining exactly what I would say. But let me put a little more uh, of the labor piece into context. And um, first of all, we were trying to solve a problem. And I think it wasn't, yes, we had had these side chapters. So for people who had followed trade agreements, you know, they were side chapters. They were unenforceable. They were non-binding. We had a case with, you know, Guatemala that took eight years. I mean, it was a mess. And workers knew that basically there were no guardrails in these kind of economic models and in trade agreements. So the first thing we were trying to solve is we needed a mechanism that was going to be binding, quick, and enforceable. Workers needed to know they had a problem, there was a violation, it was going to get resolved in a timely fashion. And actually for business also, you don't want something dragging on, solve it. Let's get it, you know, let's get some, uh, a peaceful negotiation moving. We were also trying to close the wage gap between manufacturing workers in the U.S. and Mexico, which is 10 to 1. And I would say it's still about 10 to 1. Um, that said, in the cases that the ambassador outlined, um, what we have seen are real wins for workers. She started to outline some of them. Let me add a few others. Um, we've seen, and this is in um, the research of, of Professor Mark Ganner from Penn State University, about 11 percent uh, improvement in wages and social protection from those cases. So workers are seeing real benefits from the rapid response mechanism, right? It means um, they are, uh, we just heard about the elections. I think people who aren't in the weeds on uh, labor politics in Mexico, the traditional model was something called a protection contract. So companies would go in and say, here, we're going to, well, you know, we'll take care of the a corrupt union would say, we'll take care of this for you, right? Here's what the workers want. Usually what the contract said, first of all, the workers never saw the contract, and what was in the contract was usually the law. And so what you want in a collective bargaining agreements, right, is that workers come to the table with companies, and they, if there's profit, that's how you deal with inequality, right? But since there was no real bargaining happening, we couldn't get wages to rise. Um, and so you couldn't get raises, uh, wages to rise in Mexico. You couldn't get wages to rise uh, here in the United States. They're interconnected. They're in the same supply chains. So that was another problem that we were trying to solve with the rapid response mechanism. And I think the other um, issue was changing um, the model of protection contract unions so that workers could have an independent voice. Workers could have power in the workplace. And when I say power, it's not just about wages. It's about health and safety when COVID hit. We just heard the ambassador say, how did that impact things? Um, you know, that you can sit at the table with employers and negotiate how health and safety should happen in your workplace. It's a whole set of issues. And so this is the transformation that we're seeing. Um, there's also a whole set of commitments that Mexico made around gender equity. A lot of these independent unions are being um, uh, led by young women, which is transformational um, in Mexico. The other context that's important is the rapid res response mechanism isn't happening in a vacuum. Mexico itself has a labor law reform um, process. We just heard about a uh, you know, cr uh, process around corruption, around um, the justice system. So it's the whole package in which you have to see this rapid response mechanism happening. Um, I would say overall, as we heard, there's been a number of cases. It's not a huge amount. Um, I would say we still need to see um, how that will actually address some of the issues I've just laid out. We still need to deal with that gap in wages. It's still a huge issue. And we have the additional issue that, although we've talked about um, rules of origin, we now have Mexico setting up shop in, um, in Mexico, right? And so they're not playing by the same rules and guardrails. And so how will that impact some of these um, discussions between the three countries? We need to recognize that Mexico um, is taking advantage of some of these guardrails and not playing by the same rules. So... Um, I would leave it there, but overall, I think what the ambassador said, this has been transformational. Um, it, when people say the gold standard, I just want to emphasize, it is the gold standard and the floor. So I, you know, because as we talk about, a lot of people are talking here in D.C. about, you know, the next iteration of trade policy, what do the frameworks look like? And I just want to say that this is exciting, but it's the floor. And the idea now is what do we build upon uh, the rapid response mechanism, you know, we're looking at this, whether it's through the critical mineral lens or through other supply chains, which is in the Indo-Pacific economic framework. This should be seen as a floor. It's the gold standard of what we have, which is what the ambassador said, but it should not be seen as the end all. Great. Um, that's, that's very helpful. There's a lot there. Um, and and I, do, I do want to just, uh, we had a chapter written by Santiago Levy in an earlier USMCA forward report, um, which looked at 
the impact of the Labor chapter and the rapid response mechanism on average wages in Mexico. And um, it's a complicated argument, but he essentially makes the case that it's going to be very hard to raise average labour rates without major kind of reform of the social security infrastructure in Mexico, which pushes a lot of labourers into the informal market. Um, so I take your point. I mean, there's a lot more that needs to be done, I think, domestically in, in Mexico. When you talk about the next iteration of labour standards, this is a floor, not, not the ceiling and so forth, do you have... A, are you able to articulate any of what you might be thinking of in terms of what more could be done in this space from a trade perspective? Absolutely. Well, first of all, this only covers um, two uh, fundamental labor standards, which is in our trade policy, so freedom of association and collective bargaining. Um, we've also been um, dealing with forced labor in our trading system, and that is not covered on the rep rapid response, child labor, OSH violations, um, discrimination. So you could expand um, this, and th so that could be um, quite effective. Um, you know, also we're looking when we ex th think about some of the challenges we have on um, workers who are trying to, and this is linked to freedom of association, more intentionally talking about union neutrality, making sure that companies and employers aren't intervening in actual union elections. Because even with the rapid response mechanism, you're seeing a lot of pressure on the workers on when they're going to vote and a lot of issues um, that happen there. So I think there's ways to expand this. Um, uh, but I think it's a very powerful tool. And, you know, we're getting quite creative in these new frameworks with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, even though you don't have market access. Um, we have in one of the pillars uh, a new facility-specific mechanism um, in the supply chain pillar. And so what will that look like? And so, again, it's the floor upon which we're going to continue to have these discussions and build. And, you know, I would hope as we go towards um, the review that this is something that is upheld by all three countries, um, that it's actually seen as something positive. Again, it needs to be part of the larger commitment to transformation in Mexico of labor law. And we need to, as the U.S., commit to continuing to fund it. Um, we had massive resources that went into dealing with reform of the labor system as well as dealing with corruption. And right now, that, those, that funding will be running out. So we need to make sure that we have robust funding for USMCA going forward. If not, we will only be partially there. Yeah. Great, that's super helpful. Um, Juan, do you, do, I'm going to bring you in, but I just want to know if you want to have, add anything on the Labor piece um, from, from, the, from the Mexican perspective. No, I think there's a lot of very constructive work uh, ahead of us, and uh, we're all in the right uh, frequency as to what needs to be done. I, I, uh, I think that uh, realism is going to be a very important point, and we're going to take things a step at a time. But what is very constructive is the fact that what we've already progressed. I mean, and uh, and uh, and I would emphasize that. Great. Well, let me pick up on I think a couple of points you both made um, and just tie it into the review process more specifically. I've, I've outlined what that is, so we don't need to get into that again in detail. Um, maybe start again with you. Kathy, how, how are you thinking about this joint review period? I think it's uh, been framed as an opportunity to update the agreement. I think there's clearly different views on what that means. I think there's um, concern about the extent that outstanding disputes should or shouldn't be brought into this discussion. Ambassador Tai had a, a view that this should be part of the discussion, where disputes are outstanding. Others have said we should just settle these disputes separately. Um, and then I think there's a longer-term question of this is if this is going to be an ongoing constructive process, how do, how do we build it so that it actually turns into that? Um, so there's a lot there. Don't feel you need to respond to everything, but the floor's yours on, the, on those issues. Again, I think a lot of the comments Ambassador Tai reflect sort of those of us that were in the process. This was a hard piece, you know. <laughs> this, this was a hard piece to to get settled. Um, I would also just add, uh, we have to say it, well, you know, there's a political moment here in these countries, right? We're going into election, and I think that has a lot to do, and we need to recognize um, that that could also have an impact, um, I think maybe more here than in, in, in Mexico. But, um, you know, I, I also think just uh, opening, I would be nervous just to open up the agreement. I think that um, there's a lot of good pieces that still need to be effectively implemented there. I do think this piece around um, China and rules of origin and kind of closing some of the gaps needs to be addressed, whether it's, you know, at this table or another table. Um, I think that's, that's going to be a huge issue. Ambassador Tai talked about overcapacity issues. So I think those are issues that could be discussed. Um, um, but I think that, um, you know, leading up to the review, um, there's a lot of work still to be done. You know, what are these pieces, at least from a labor perspective, um, that we still need to make sure there's effective implementation? Again, I mean, the 19 cases she spoke about, that's, that's a, a small amount in terms of transforming a labor system. 
Um, so I hope that, you know, whatever happens politically, all the parties come with good faith um, to look at a review, to look at how do you strengthen. Um, you know, she talked about the parties coming with discomfort. I would just argue there's probably, there's already discomfort. You know, we talked to STPS. There is discomfort with the rapid response labor mechanism. There is, there are disagreements. That's okay. I mean, I think there's been, you know, so how is this a table for discussion? Um, you know, uh, you know, going forward, I guess that's the most important thing, keeping a space where there's commitments to continue to engage, commitments to address these issues that are tough. There could be disagreements on how many cases come with the rapid response mechanism. I would encourage all the countries, again, I think the last round table we had, even the business community said, like, this has actually not been such, you know, they were worried at the beginning. Mm. And I think we heard folks from the business community say it's actually, you know, it hasn't been that bad. I mean, the cases that have been brought have impacted corporations that have supply chains here. And overall, they've been resolved. Right. They've, they've yielded like good, good conversations at the table. And I think there's um, more peaceful relationships, uh, you know, in those workplaces. And so that's a win. Um, hopefully that will be part of the review. Strong dialogue, making sure that um, what's working continues. Um, making sure that it's, you know, USMCA, as she said, in a changing context. I think we have issues around technology, issues around um, the border, right? I mean, USMCA is just a piece of the puzzle in our relationship with Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Um, Josh, if I may. Yeah, Juan, over to you. Uh, I would just like to, I, I think I would like to shift for a moment from uh, what we all agree is important on the labor side, but look at the broader picture of all the things that we need to be preparing for. Yep. And I think that the work that is being done by Brookings jointly with Canada and, of course, U.S. and Mexico, of identifying all the things that are working, that are successful, that we want to make sure that we don't uh, stumble and find ourselves being a handicap to the, the kind of progress that is needed, I think is very important. I know we're into that work full time now. And the, the, the case stories uh, and, the, and, the, and the momentum and the... In general, the drive of what is occurring in terms of making sure that we make North America the most competitive region and the most attractive region in the world, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget what our target is for all the three countries. I couldn't agree more that we have to be able to identify all of those opportunities for improvement. And I, I, I emphasize that part because that's what we really think we need to look at uh, uh, in light of what has already occurred and is occurring. Uh, the, the, the political changes in both countries and in, 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 in any event, maybe even in three, who knows, uh, it should not be the driver. The driver should be precisely the spirit with which what this was thought of, which is let's identify everything that's been done well and make sure we strengthen it. And let's try and find other areas where we can collaborate and make uh, you know this stronger and better and and even more successful. And I think that that's where the work of the next uh, year and a half, uh, Josh, with you and your team and all three all three teams, is going to be enormously important to set the stage for the right kind of discussions that we're looking forward to. It's yeah. an opportunity to improve. Yeah, no, I think the point about building on what we already have, I think, is very well taken. And Ambassador Tai, I think, made some very strong points about how much has changed since USMCA came into effect. Um, so we're in a rapidly changing environment. Um, let me use this opportunity to actually open it up for some audience um, Q&A. And maybe we'll take a couple of questions. Um, we have one gentleman here um, at the front and, and a gentleman there at, at the back, and we'll see how we're going for time after that. This was a fascinating discussion. My name is Ujwala Puri, and I work at CBP, U.S. Customs Office of Trade. And my question is, how will advancements in AI and robotics, which lower manufacturing costs and improve efficiency in transfer transportation, affect the trade enforcement mechanisms and agreements that exist currently that were created before the rise of AI, since they can like reduce the cost of goods and how it will challenge the effectiveness of our trade policies? Would we perhaps see like a potential transformation in rewriting of all the trade rules in terms of protecting worker rights with this advance in technology and robotics. Maybe we'll grab a couple of questions and, and um, one at the back there. Yep. In transportation, he said AI in transportation. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. Ms. Sarang Shidore, Quincy Institute. Question for Kathy Feingold. Uh, it seems like you do have a lot of experience in this space and also in the ITU negotiations. So you must have seen that there are worker constituencies in developing countries of the global south who have a different perspective from labor unions in the United States where they do see a role of comparative advantage in terms of even wage gaps to a degree and other things. So can you speak to the fact that in these complex trade agreements between a wealthy country and a less advanced country, that it cannot be one side that prescribes a norm that applies to all uh, workers everywhere. There may be differences among workers in different countries. And how does the AFL-CIO see that uh, as a way to model trade agreements going forward in a world that's becoming much more multipolar? Thank you. Um, so, you know, Juan, Kathy, feel to p pick up on any of those questions um, you, you might want to. Um, Juan, do you want to kick off with any an answer to any of those questions? I think the fact that you have to take into account the uh, the, the, the lifestyle, resources, uh, needs, customs, and sensitivities of the differences between the labor forces is enormously important. One size does not fit all. I mean, that is very clear. And if, when you, you can uh, drive towards the target, Josh, which is clear, which is to improve the quality of life, improve the savings, improve the health, improve uh, the education, et cetera, but do it at the, st at the stage and at the rate and at the rhythm that you really uh, can achieve. And so I think that that point made right now by the man who made the question is very important. One size does not fit all. But one target does fit all. Kathy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I will um, thank you for the question. Um, so first of all, just, uh, you know, I wear, I wear two hats. So I sit in, I, I, what I like to, I always sit in the hot seat. I love it. You know, I'm in the U.S. and I have U.S. workers hollering about what's happening globally. And then I represent um, at the International Trade Union Confederation, which is the global body. I get there. So I, I take what, your question quite seriously is my point. Um, and I would say the way we deal with it in the AFL-CIO is we don't move forward with any recommendations to the U.S. government without partnering with the um, workers and unions in that other country. Whether it be Mexico, I just got back from Kenya in December. We, joined, we signed a joint uh, agreement and statement with COTUK, which is the Confederation of Trade Unions in Kenya. So we sit at the table and we negotiate together first. So it is not just an AFL-CIO voice. We'll bring it back home. We'll say to Ambassador Tai's team, here's what the AFL-CIO and COTUK came together to say um, would be the best. Because some of the issues, you're absolutely right. I'm, informal workers in the flower sector in Kenya probably wouldn't be top of mind sitting in Washington, D.C. So it's really important to me that um, we sit with our partners, we negotiate what is going to be a set of joint recommendations. We do that in every trade policy. We had a table for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework with almost all of the unions. Um, we had the Filipino labor movement come up here and meet with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan to talk about you know, the red tagging happening. Again, issues that in D.C. you're not thinking about anti-communism red tagging. There, they're killing call centers. One of our trading partners is killing call center workers. That has to be brought into the conversation because, you know, one size doesn't fit all because there are issues um, in, in every country. But the other mechanism that deals with this one size doesn't fit all is collective bargaining. That's precisely why you want an independent labor movement in the countries. We're not there to tell them what, you know, what the wages should be or what in your factory, um, you know, the break time should look like. That's why you want democracy in the workplace. That is precisely why in trade agreements we are advocating for having strong independent unions that can bargain collectively, whether in Kenya, Philippines, or Mexico. When you have that, you're dealing with the imbalance of power between workers and capital and employers, right? So when you have collective bargaining in the Philippines, they might put in a call center contract something that looks quite different than in the export processing zones of Mexico. That's why you want collective bargaining. Nobody is saying there is one size fits all. What we're saying is there are a set of tools that give power to workers. And those tools are called freedom of association, the right to organize an independent union, and uh, collective bargaining, to bargain with your employer, and to then live free from a, a child labor, forced labor, and discrimination. So that's how we approach it. Um, and I would say, I think I got to the colleague's question, and I, it's not my area of expertise. I think you were talking about AI and sort of logistics, and is that? In the terms of how the AI will impact existing enforcement mechanisms to protect labor rights. 
Oh, enforcement. Thank you so much. Um, how AI will. Um, so I think, you know, artificial intelligence, um, it, it can go both ways. Right, and I think this is something that we're dealing as a, with as a labor movement, and it's probably a longer conversation. So I don't, but I'm happy to talk with you. But I think you know, AI and democracy is how we see it. And so AI can either be for us um, a use of really good, important information for workers, or it can be something that can be quite harmful. And so, how do we harness? Um, artificial intelligence that can be put in service to worker power what, rather than a source of misinformation and undermining the power of workers. That would be the line. I'm happy to talk to you more about it. But I think, it could, I think the, the verdict's out about, you know, how do we use AI to deal with forced labor? It might be like you're talking about in the Uyghur region or something that could be quite challenging to be documenting. So can we use AI um, uh, if it can be used for the good um, in a way that is giving workers a new tool um, for enforcement, fantastic. If it is undermining enforcement and, and spreading misinformation, it's a problem. But we don't have the proper guardrails or regulatory policies right now to ensure that AI goes the positive way. And so I would just leave it at the verdict is still out whether or not we can use AI. We can use creative things, as you know, like with fisheries. I mean, I'm sure you're involved in this on boats when workers are isolated, making sure they have Wi-Fi, making sure they have tools so they're not thrown overboard. Or So I think there's ways that technology can be used for enforce, enforcement, um, and we just have to be very mindful that it's used in a way um, that it's co-developed with workers, so it's about their empowerment and not us doing a top-down approach. And, and I'll just add that um, in the report we've launched, there's a chapter um, on uh, essentially digital technology and trade, and so I'd refer you to that, and the author there points out on the need for more on artificial intelligence, which is certainly around the more kind of foundational models which have been released in the last 12 months was new to USMCA, so there's really nothing specifically there on that. Um, and we've, oh, there's another report we can, we can address you to, which I wrote recently on essentially reforming trade agreements for artificial intelligence, because it's another part of my kind of work stream. So if you're interested, we can, we can give you access to that. Um, I want to, uh, we're, we're, we're unfortunately, um, I saw one, we might have time for one other, I saw this, this, this lady here in the middle, and then I think we'll have to call it a, a close, unfortunately, we're again running out of time. Yeah, I was just curious for all of you on stage, kind of what potential... You could just introduce yourself briefly. Oh, um, pardon me, briefly. I'm Emma Beadle, I'm a caseworker at the IRC. Um, I'm just wondering what potential you see in USMCA infrastructure, even this RRM, rapid response infrastructure, to combat exploitation of migrant workers, speaking specifically of like agriculture and meat industries between Mexico and Central America and the U.S. Um, and, you know, these workers support some of our more robust um, supply chain structures. So what potential do you see for that kind of interaction with the USMCA? Happy to yeah. jump in. <laughs> Um, so absolutely, first of all, um, and we would need a whole other panel on this. I mean, the, you know, the H-2A issue, which I think desperately, and we've had a, a USMCA case that has looked at H-2A. Um, I think we need to look at agricultural workers on so many levels. I would say the rapid response mechanism is one tool. Um, our, one of our unions, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, has identi identified, for example, uh, the farm workers from Mexico that work here and then go across the border have all their money taken from them, right, from the border. Um, that's not, I don't think the most effective tool is a, U is, is a USMCA trade complaint. It can help um, elevate the problem. But there is serious corrupt. I mean, anyone, if there, if there are border um, folks that are sh literally, this is documented, shaking down the, the workers when they're coming home because everyone knows the bus is coming you know, back from North Carolina, that's a whole other set of issues that could be part of the conversation um, with the Mexican government. How do we protect workers who are, go who are putting food on our table, going home to put food on their, their families' tables when they get back to Mexico, and making sure they get good wages, protections, the labor movement's position, they should have a right to a union, you know, health and safety. The one thing I would say about uh, immigration, because it's so big, um, we advocate in the U.S. We spend 12 times as much as on immigration enforcement as we do in labor enforcement. Imagine if we spent that money on labor enforcement so that anyone working, I don't care, with documents or not, was in a safe poultry factory, safe, safe meat packing factory, agricultural workplace, right? It's about making sure we have the tools, labor inspection, labor enforcement. So I would say um, there's more to build out on that and happy to talk to you. Excellent. Um, Juan, any, any final remarks before we uh, close? No, I just would like to make a comment on the whole agricultural side. Uh, we've established as a Mexican private sector a very close working relationship with different areas of the U.S. economy. And probably one of the strongest relationships is precisely everything that has to do with agriculture. And as you know, we are uh, 
facing a number of differences of uh, rulings that need to be solved, and as I already mentioned. But there's also an enormous exchange going on in terms of capabilities, in terms of methodologies, and in terms of efficiencies, where I would uh, clearly think that this, uh, uh, this enormous complementarity that exists on the agricultural side between the U.S. and Mexico, which has proved out over 30 years since NAFTA, will be receiving the benefit of a much, uh, I would say, much more uh, people-related improvements, uh, on, on especially on, on the Mexican side. And I think we're very aware of that and looking for it. On the terms of the amount that is being taken away from the workers coming back, I would prefer to have a, you know, a... a uh, an official opinion on what what amounts those are and so on, so that I don't make a guess. But I, what I can tell you is that the amount sent by the Mexican workers in the U.S. back into Mexico in reaching the hands of the Mexican families and so on is well over sixty-five billion dollars a year right now. So there's not, it, 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 if anything is being taken by them at the border. It's a minor part of what it, of what the total amount is going back to the different families. So, it, is it something to be explored further? Certainly, but it's uh, the the complementarity of our agriculture with your agriculture is enormous. I mean, we're and uh, and the the numbers are there. I mean, we are the number one exporter and the number one buyer in both directions of all of uh, agricultural goods. So. It's, it's worked in that sense. I remember at the beginning of the negotiation of NAFTA, there was an enormous concern on the Mexican side that how are we going to be able to compete with the U.S.? And the fact of the matter is, no, we complement each other on the whole agricultural side. Our tomatoes are the ones that you're consuming, and your corn is the one that we're consuming, and, and so on. So there's a, there's a, there's more to be built on that, Josh. But I think that basically, the relationship on that in that in that whole sector is extremely strong, close, and workable. And I know that both sides of the, uh, including the Canadian side, will be very active in the process of the review that will be coming up. Great, thanks, Juan. Um, we're going to draw this panel to a close. So, um, Juan, I want to thank you so much for your time dialing in from Mexico. And Cassie, thank you so much for being here. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank, thank you.
yeah. down. I think that's fine. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's a little a little overkill. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, everyone. If uh, we we're about to kick off the third panel, um, if you could please be seated, that'd be appreciated. Um, welcome back for the third panel of, of the afternoon. I'm going to run through the bios fairly quickly. The, the challenge with, with extremely accomplished experts is the bio is always very long. Um, so if everyone could please uh, <laughs> tolerate my um, editing as, as I go through this. I'm going to <laughs> just go um, through in, in order, um, starting with... Um, Starting with Alejandro Palacios, who is the uh, who's a senior fellow at the Seoul Price School of Public Policy, um, an independent board member and former me uh, chair of Mexican's antitrust um, agency. Uh, so I should just elaborate: she's a senior fellow at the University of Southern California Price School of Public Policy, um, and she's a director on various uh, corporations in Mexico. And between September 2013 and 2021, she was chair of Mexican's antitrust agency, um, amongst other, other important roles. Um, next, um, Ambassador, Ambassador Geronimo Gutierrez, who is currently senior advisor at Covington and Burlington and uh, managing partner of Beale Infrastructure. He also sits on various boards has many, many years of experience in senior government positions in the Mexican um, government, um, including most recently as Mexico's ambassador to the, to the United States, where he, he was an in integral part of the team negotiating the USMCA. Uh, next, uh, Luz Maria de la Mora um, is currently a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Adrian Ashe Latin American Center and also a consultant to the supply chain group in Mexico City. Um, she's also held many senior roles in the Mexican government, most recently from December 2018 to 2022, where she was Vice Minister of Foreign Trade in the Ministry of Economy of Mexico. And uh, Rob House, I uh, should say Professor House, um, <laughs> Lloyd Nissi Nelson, Professor of International Law um, at NYU Law School, was my um, SJD supervisor from Michigan Law School, so it's always a pleasure to have him with me here, and he is you know, one of the world's leading experts, really, on international law and international trade law. Um, yeah, he's been a visiting fellow at London School of Economics, a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Tel Aviv University, Hebrew University, and has written more books and articles than I'm going to even begin to list. Um, but if you're interested in international law, international trade law, would highly recommend them. Um, let me start now with... Uh, the, uh, I've got questions here um, for all the panellists, but similarly, I would um, encourage um, all the panellists to feel free to um, come in and, um, you know, engage in any of the questions that they want to and that they find interesting. Um, Alejandro, I'm going to um, start with you. Um, you've contributed a chapter to the USMCA Ford Report, so thank you very much for that, and you wrote extensively about the digital trade chapter, which is really one of the most ambitious digital trade chapters in any agreement anywhere, I think. And um, what's your view on how the digital trade chapter is going, um, and particularly with respect to how it is benefiting Mexico, and what more uh, we might be able to do trilaterally when you think more broadly about digital trade and a re related regulation? Hi. Um, can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Josh, for the invitation to the panel and um, for 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 the text. So yeah, uh, let um, well, digital trade refers to all forms of commerce conducted by electronic means, and um, so that trade requires cross-border data transfers, and uh, the contribution is certain. Uh, centered on those cross-border data transfers because the USMCA has this new chapter 19, as you mentioned, which is precisely about um, um, digital trade, but it includes uh, commitments, re relevant commitments uh, that the three partners have taken in terms to secure cross-border uh, cross data flows between, between the three countries. Um, the value of trade in digitally ordered goods and services across the three countries could be as high as 250 billion a year, 
And um, data transfer include, for example, businesses across North America streamlining uh, their inventories and um, forecasting demand and relevant issues for um, resilient uh, supply chains or using the cloud, using artificial intelligence for small and medium companies and making them more productive. And that is, of course, very relevant for the Mexican economy. So regarding these commitments, there really hasn't been a dispute now, uh, but there's been uh, certain red lights. Uh, for example, there's a regulation in Mexico uh, regarding um, data localization uh, restrictions for fintech companies. And there's also a proposed Canada digital tax uh, service requiring that um, regarding that uh, the information is kept in Canada. So that could go against these rules. But more generally, what we're seeing, and um, Ambassador Tai talked about this, is a new geopolitic context where um, there's issues between um, digital trade in uh, between China and the US. And there's also a regulatory push in the three countries, um, specifically in the U.S., in terms of AI regulation, cybersecurity, uh, privacy data issues that might challenge what the rules of the USMCA say. Um, so uh, we know that the U.S., for example, has withdrawn its support for rules like uh, prohibiting national requirements on data localization and reviewing, reviewing source codes at the uh, World Trade Organization. And those rules are part of the USMCA. So what we do in this chapter is uh, we talk about uh, how this regulatory push uh, might have impact, as I said, creating barriers to data flow in the future, might even be contrary to the USMCA rules. So what we need is a place, a forum, where uh, U.S., Canada, and Mexico can discuss digital issues. Because going forward, the digital economy um, will keep advancing. Countries will want to regulate uh, their, their digital markets. And so even if rules in Mexico, U.S., and Canada are not the same, there needs to be common values on what we understand for privacy, what we want for AI. How do we want to share that? And you can only do that when you have a place, a council, an institutionalized um, meeting where you can talk about um, these very relevant issues that are becoming more relevant as the whole economy digitalizes. Great, thanks. And, and, and one of the recommendations that came out of your, your chapter, which you um, re referred to there about having a forum or a, a place institutionally within the agreement um, to discuss digital issues, I think is a, a really good one. It, it's actually come up similarly if in, in, from other contributions to the USMCA forward report. So I think this is something we definitely need to give more thought to. Um, let me um, turn it now to um, we'll just go down the line here. Um, what, what can you, uh, one, one of the things that we've been talking about back and forth today is obviously the, the review clause, um, and we know now some of the history um, of its difficult ne negotiation and partly why we have what is a fairly convoluted um, statement in the review clause. But at the same time, there's very little in the review clause about what it should look like, how it should run, uh, what are the processes that should be put in place and what the vision for the review clause should be beyond a general understanding of updating the agreement. Um, where, what's your perception on how we should be approaching the review clause and how could we build it into something that is productive and leads to keeping this agreement up to date? And I'll just bracket that by saying... Um, I think keeping trade agreements up to date has generally been difficult. Um, I think all trade agreements have got various forms of let's keep it up to date. This is the most sort of um, ambitious in the way that it links review to a potential termination of the agreement. Uh, but I think if we're thinking about making this genuinely a living agreement that does respond to changing economic and other geopolitical dynamics, uh, what can we do? How do we think about the review clause to make that real? Thank you, Josh, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, very quickly, because I have a lot, a lot to say. But number one, I think that the review clause, as it was uh, rightly described by Ambassador Tai, was a sort of a compromise uh, on two different visions about how to address 
uh, the fact that NAFTA did not have was, you know, eternal, essentially, uh, and that there, there was a need to have a mechanism to review, and that's a clause. To your question, how should we approach it? Extremely carefully, because I think we have, if we're not careful about the politics involved in that process, which is intended to be a very technical process, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, led by the Free Trade Commission, mm -hmm. we're not going to face that. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. We're going to face an extremely politicized environment within each of the countries and within North America. And if we're not careful, we can end up uh, you know, transforming what it's a review process for improvement into something uh, that could ha actually damage I think severely the overall trade and investment relationship. And I don't, I don't pretend to be exaggerated, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm wrong, but that is what I see. I have to defer a little bit from Ambassador Tai in the sense that, uh, from what I understood, and I may be wrong, we are, I guess we're, you know, the current disputes, we're just, we'll probably go into the 2026. Um, and I also defer in, in, in the sense that as I understood, dispute mechanisms are intended to depoliticize trade. And I'm not naive about the fact that trade, there's a huge political component to it, but those mechanisms are, are set there precisely to depoliticize, to make sure that if there is, you know, if, there's, if, if the political situation, the solution is not there, that you have a mechanism to enforce it. And, I just think we should be careful uh, with respect to that. Um, and what I'm most afraid of also is that <clears throat> the, assuming that the review mechanism is something conducted by, you know, essentially the Free Trade Commission and governments with obviously participation from different stakeholders and refers to the agreement itself, there are so many additional things going on in the relationship, in the, you know, both trilaterally and bilaterally, that you know, everybody's going to hang, try to hang something into the Christmas tree. And, uh, and I, so in, sh in short, we have to be careful. And USMCA, you know, if, if there's one thing that I agree with previous comments, is that you have to judge, in my view, USMCA in the context in which we it was negotiated and we're currently in, and not in the context of uh, the free trade 90s. And w why do I mention that? Because it was why, quite an accomplishment given the, uh, to, to get to this agreement, given the fact that people are much more skeptical vis-a-vis that time about free trade, and I think that's a mistake, but that's my own view. Uh, we, you know, but, but what we need is, uh, to make sure that people understand as we go into the review process that we have, that, that USMCA is not perfect, far from that, but it works and that we should take good care of it. I think that's, that would be my central message, Josh, for that part of the question. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, Luz Maria, um, you also contributed a chapter to the report. Uh, thank you very much. You've been a long-time supporter of our work. Um, talk to me about... We've, we've heard quite a bit about nearshoring, um, mm -hmm. where Mexico is well-situated to take advantage of this, but where Mexico is falling short. Um, this is not only a Mexico issue, um, because if we think about this as supply chain resiliency and economic security, this is a North American issue, ensuring that all three economies are well-placed to really create the business and investment environments that can enable these investments to actually take place and mature to produce competitive products. How are we going? How is Mexico going? Where, where are we at? What more needs to be done? It's a big question, so pick a piece of that and take it where you may. Sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Josh. Thank you for the invitation to be here with you, and uh, it's an honor for me to be in this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, where we are with respect to nearshoring, Mexico has um, two, let's say, unique assets that make it different from other countries in the world with respect to the U.S. One is that we have USMCA, 
and the other one is that we have the border. Those two assets are essential for um, Mexico to continue to be um, a, a location where companies want to um, invest. Um, second point is that Mexico today is the U.S. number one trading partner. The U.S., Mexico, and Canada are well suited to produce together to um, have an efficient North America to produce more, produce better, and produce more effectively to be able to compete vis-a-vis -vis factory Asia, which is not minor. Um, but I, I guess that the other element in this nearshoring opportunity for Mexico has to do with China, and this was already mentioned by Ambassador Tai. Why China? Because we know that there's a China-U.S. trade war, that we are not clear exactly how this may be solved or worked out, or well, what will be the new rules between the U.S. and China in terms of how they will deal with not only trade, uh, investment, and also uh, China 2025. No? Um, and we also... I think it was, uh, Ambassador Tai was very clear about how the U.S. Um, is dealing with China and how China may be part of the 2026 review. But I would say that in that part of the 2026 review and the China component, I would, I would hope that we have a trilateral vision, that we have a North American vision to deal with China. Um, Mexico has um, several areas of opportunity to continue to improve its position as a, an ideal partner to the U.S. and to North America, and also to be able to attract more investment. As you know, there are um, billions of dollars that have been advertised as coming to Mexico. Just last week, we had a new investment from Amazon, $5 billion, that were um, announced as investment, and it's already operating in Querétaro. We, all, we know also that there are companies like Tesla that have a promise that there will be investments, and we, we do see companies coming into Mexico to um, re um, relocate their production, and also with the idea of um, de-risking from China and, uh, and uh, serving the U.S. market. There are several areas in which I think Mexico needs to work strongly in order to be able to maximize the opportunity that we have today for nearshoring. Um, infrastructure, no doubt. Infrastructure, physical infrastructure regarding uh, roads, transportation, railroads, airports, ports, energy, and telecommunications. Uh, it's essential that Mexico strengthens the investments, private and public, uh, to develop a 5G or 6G to be able to develop a digital economy, as Hannah was already mentioning. Second point, we need to work on um, a secure but efficient border. Our border is probably one of our most important competitive assets. We need to invest uh, for customs facilitation and trade facilitation. And um, two additional points, good regulatory practices. We have a chapter... Um, Chapter 28 on, on regulations, Chapter 12 on sectoral annexes, Chapter 11 on technical barriers to trade. For example, sectoral annexes, there's plenty of progress to be made there. Um, we need to make sure that regulations in the region are regulations that are efficient, that are transparent, and that reduce cost, not become uh, a burden. And the last point I would say has to do with human resources. I think that the labor question is, um, is, should not only be focused on the implementation of uh, Chapter 23 and the la rapid response labor mechanism. I think that we need to en envision our human uh, talent and human resource as um, a resource that needs to be improved in terms of education, skill, and um, we need to invest heavily on our um, workforce so that they can actually reap the benefits of nearshoring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's comprehensive and, and, and gives us a lot to get into. Um, Rob, 
you wrote the chapter on dispute settlement for the report. Again, thank you for that. There's a couple of ways we can probably get into this question. Um, maybe I'll just uh, briefly frame this in terms of there's been probably a sea change in various approach to international dispute settlement. Certainly we've seen the US withdraw its support for the appellate body, the WTO, yet at the same time we're seeing greater investment in dispute settlement mechanisms in bilateral and regional trade agreements and certainly the um, use of the state-to-state -state dispute settlement in USMCA is, you know, fairly robust, I think, compared to past practice. Um, but there are other reforms that have happened, uh, particularly rolling back of the ISDS mechanism as well. Uh, so what, what's your... How do you see the role of state-to-state -state dispute settlement at the moment evolving? What can we expect of it in the USMCA context? Ambassador Tai provided a, f a vision for what I think state-to-state -state dispute settlement means and how what role it can have to solve disputes. Um, any comments you might or reflections you might want to have on that as well would be great. Well, I would just start by saying that um, one of the uh, strengths of um, the USMCA is that you know Canada, the US, and Mexico um, have uh, a very uh, rich relationship or a set of relationships that go very deep. So there are many ways of addressing uh, disputes. There are lots of um, uh, political uh, uh, discussions. There are, you know, trade-offs with other issues like the border and so on. So um, even though I think it's promising that there is an effective way of getting a legal, where, where a legal reading is important, where um, a dispute turns on some significant difference of views as to how to read the legal text, I think then, you know, you want the opinion of, of jurists uh, through something like legal dispute settlement. But in terms of uh, mm -hmm. settling disputes in a more holistic way, there are lots of means of doing it, um, as opposed to, you know, countries that don't have much of a relationship or even a hostile relationship, I think they're more dependent upon, you know, Speech. some kind of, um, you know, uh, delegation to an arbitrator or legal panel uh, to settle disputes. I, I would also circle back to something Ambassador Tai said, which I thought was very, uh, uh, very insightful, which is that you have the legal process, but then in state-to-state -state dispute settlement, the, the ultimate remedy, right, is that uh, the losing state um, changes its policies. And so if we contrast that with investor state dispute settlement, if the investor wins, they get a monetary award. And that's very problematic from the point of view of future regulatory challenge. So I'm very happy that uh, ISDS has been significantly rolled back in, in the USMCA, which we could discuss. But the implication of a remedy where a state has to change its policies is that you're then into a political process uh, because in democracies, obviously, um, it, it's not as if a ruler can snap their fingers and all of a sudden uh, a policy that's been found to be in violation of the uh, agreement can uh, be magically removed. And so depending on whether it involves legislative changes, changes to arcane regulations, whether expert agencies are involved and so on, um, the policy change piece of the picture can be complicated, uh, lengthy, and on the other hand, it's really the remedy you want at the end of the day, right? So um, it has both um, a challenge to it and also a an opportunity you know, to fix something that's not working in accordance with the legal agreements. And uh, again here, I think the, the richness of, the, of these relationships um, is such that at, at the end of the day, I think you're going to get those policy changes because each of these countries knows a lot about the other's policy processes and, and so um, is able to understand why something might be moving forward fast or might be very complicated and tied in with perhaps other issues and, and stakeholders who uh, have to be brought into the picture and, uh, and, um, and addressed if you're going to make those policy changes. 
Thanks, Rob. That, that's actually really, um, really helpful. Uh, and in your chapter, you do, I think, usefully situate um, the role of dispute settlement within the broader kind of relationship uh, and that point about the depth and the complexity of this trilateral relationship and its familiarity to the many actors and where dispute settlement fits into that is, is really important in thinking about what various instances of non-compliance may or may not mean for the broader relationship. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to open up for Q&A um, at the moment, so um, if you uh, want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. We'll collect a couple at the moment. Um, this lady down at the front here and this gentleman um, at the back here will start with... And, and, and this gentleman here will start with three um, and four. <laughs> cool. Um, let's start with three and we'll come back to you to, as, as a final one. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm from the South China Morning Post. So I have a question related to China. And there has been lots of concern in the U.S. about Chinese investment in Mexico, although the absolute number is actually quite small. And at the same time, Tesla has also brought lots of uh, car parts suppliers to Mexico to build factories over there. But then um, the U.S. and Mexico have reached an agreement in December in terms of screening uh, foreign investment with China in mind, clearly. I'm just curious, how can this be done? Uh, like, can uh, Mexico just block Chinese investment if the U.S. is really concerned about it. <coughs> they, we'll, collect, we'll collect a few questions. So there's what, what, um, he, he, yep, and, and at the back. Uh, thank you. My name is Daniel Rangel. I work at Rethink Trade, uh, a program of the American Economic Liberties Project. I, I want to ask a question about digital, and I understand the concern about being very ambitious about changes, but one of the big policy changes that we have seen in the past four years is the change in the U.S. position about digital trade. And considering that that's the case, and considering that, as Mrs. Palacios said, there's certain policies that also Mexico and Canada are considering that might conflict with these rules, and the fact that the main reason why the U.S. decided to change uh, its position with regards to the USMCA-style rules is that they don't leave enough policy space to undertook several regulations in AI or privacy legislation, whether it's a good idea to adopt some of what her ideas of saying we need maybe a forum, we need uh, common values, but not have these binding rules that could conflict with the policies that have been adopted and that could potentially be adopted. So maybe suspending the most problematic rules of the digital trade chapter or even leaving them out of the dispute settlement mechanism. And just to say, this is something that has been done, for instance, by Australia and Singapore in some of their agreements on digital. Great. Um, and, and, and one more. And one more. Yes. Hello, Antonio Ortiz from Dentos Global Advisors and Georgetown University. Uh, great discussion. Uh, one topic that I think merits mention is uh, Section 232 tariffs. Ambassador Tai mentioned that Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. should work together, work complementary economies to deal with some international economic and geopolitical challenges. And as we speak, there are discussions uh, you know, led by USTR on Mexico, U.S. Steel. In the case of Canada, it's the U.S. is aluminum or aluminum, depending on how you want to say that. I think it is very, very difficult to think about stability, joint production, and automobiles and other projects if we keep fighting over uh, steel and aluminum within North America. So I think that's something that should be addressed. Gracias. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll leave up the panelists uh, to address any of the questions that they might wish. Um, let me... Um, start. Uh, would you like to digital, comment? perhaps? Yeah, okay. digital, if you prefer. Okay. We can't hear you. <sighs> I'll start with the China one. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. now we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So that is a very good question, and uh, mm, so there are these rules. Uh, in, in Chapter 19, although there could be exceptions for legitimate public policy and national security concerns. 
So the idea of the forum is exactly this. What are these legitimate policy and public um, national security concerns that need to be dealt before we go in, into uh, into a dispute. So a lot of the panel has been about the role of disputes, and it's very nice that there's this dispute, but the idea is to work together before we get there. And so, as I say, this place could um, could be this place where we can talk about what is legitimate in terms of public policy and national <laughs> security, that those exceptions could go forward. Uh, in terms of national exports, in the digital trade chapter, we talk about that, and one of the questions we make without an answer, is if the USMCA should have um, eventually a chapter on export controls because it's coming a, it's becoming a very uh, relevant topic, at least in the digital space. Thank you. Um, and and I, I just might add a two finger to that. I, I think the, the table stakes is that you need to have policy flexibility to address new problems clearly. I think then the question becomes, does the agreement provide the flexibility for governments to experiment and adapt and d develop legitimate policies or not. Um, and I think that's sort of a legal question in part. Um, so this is just to underscore your point, Alejandro, I think that there's a lot of flexibilities built into uh, USMCA with the various exceptions provision or not. So the question is, is there enough, I think. Um, other panellists on, on, on other questions. China investment just, just in, in very Mexico. Briefly, I, I agree with you. We don't know what the MOU signed in December really means. It was signed by the Treasury Department and Hacienda. It was announced, and, uh, and I may be mistaken, but to my knowledge, as of today, there has not been additional information. It was a general uh, memorandum of understanding to cooperate on investment and security matters, and that's it. And the text is quite, actually quite short. So I think it's still, um, it's, you know, there's very little information. Uh, that's that's all that I would say. I think it's important to understand the reach and the breadth of that agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, on on yeah, steel and aluminum, yeah. um, as you know, um, uh, the U.S. and the EU have entered into some discussions about um, an understanding that would include, um, uh, you know, joint efforts on on carbon emissions as well as addressing um, issues of overcapacity. And, um, you know, I, I think it makes sense uh, in principle uh, to bring um, the USMCA partners into that. Uh, there, it's stalled somewhat now in, uh, in Brussels uh, because I think of um, uh, not a well-founded view that the initiative um, will necessarily collide with WTO rules. I think there's enough flexibility of the WTO rules to work with it. But, but bringing, uh, you know, the USMCA partners into it uh, makes sense. It would be one constructive way of um, addressing the, um, uh, uh, the issue that you, you describe. Yeah, Luz Maria. Um, yep. Just adding to the China question. I think that China definitely is the elephant in the room in this case. China is Mexico's second largest trading partner. It's uh, the U.S. third largest trading partner. And when you see that the near-shoring trend, you see that suppliers from China are establishing in Mexico to be able to supply those uh, manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing operations that are coming into Mexico. But I want to just say one last thing. I think that we're talking about two different um, groups. On one hand, we have those critical sectors that the Biden administration has identified as critical, essential, with special treatment and industrial policy, where I think that there, uh, as Jeronimo was mentioning, there's attention with respect to export control. But then there's these other sectors that have to do with the trade, uh, the U.S.-China trade war where what we're seeing is just a deviation of trade. And I honestly think that, I mean, China at the end of the day will have to be, it is a player and will have to continue to be a player. I heard from the U.S. administration saying, we don't want to decouple, we want to de-risk. And I think that that is the answer here. Great, thanks. Um, look, unfortunately, we're out of time. And uh, again, I want to thank the panellists for their contributions thank to the you. report and for being panellists here today. 
Um, and thank you everyone for um, being here for these, this, this event and contributing uh, your questions. And I'll draw this event now to a close. Thanks everyone. Thank you.